Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. So this video is a continuation of, of the previous one. I'm talking about the Arctic report card for 2018. So I'll give a few more details of sort of the overall executive summary, and then I'll get right into surface air temperature over the Arctic and continue from there. So basically, the Arctic report card is a report by NOAA. National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. So it comes out every year, and it comes out in early December, just in time, and it's officially released at the American Geophysical Union Conference, which was, which was early December um, in Washington, D.C. this year. I didn't go this year. I did go last year when the conference was in New Orleans. So... This report card, it reflects on a range of land, ice, and ocean observations made throughout the Arctic during 2018. So basically 14 essays or reports written by more than 80 scientists from 12 countries. Okay, so it talks about changes that are occurring in the physical system, biological components of the Arctic changing, etc. Okay, so the Arctic, the, the, the key thing, the Arctic continues to warm at an incredible rate. Okay, it's roughly twice the rate relative to the rest of the globe. So this is called Arctic amplification. Okay, and because the Arctic is warming much faster than the equator, the temperature difference between the Arctic and the equator is greatly decreasing. And that temperature difference is why the jet streams exist. So the lower temperature gradient or difference means the jet streams slow down and become wavier and become often stuck or persistent. So the year 2018 was the second warmest year on record in the Arctic since 1900. So 2016 was the warmest. This was a strong El Nino year. Now we're expecting a strong El Nino in 2019 maybe running into 2020, so hang on to your hats in the next few years. You know, I think we're going to set uh, records, even, you know, new records. So it's a, basically 1.7 degrees Celsius relative to the long-term average, but this is only from 1981 to 2010. This is a poor choice of long-term averages because there's been tremendous warming already, you know, and, and from 20, 2000 to 2000, 2010, there's been, there was tremendous warming. So when you make an average and you, that, always, that already incorporates a lot of this earlier warming, it's kind of misleading. The long-term average should be used. You know, it should be a 30-year, if you want a 30-year period, you need to slide it back at least a decade, maybe two decades, before most of the incredible warming took off. So in the past five years, the warming has exceeded all previous records since 1900. So it's causing a sluggish and unusually wavy jet stream, abnormal weather events in both the Arctic and mid-latitudes. So these deep waves in the jet stream, we had, a, we had basically a heat wave at the North Pole in the autumn of 2017 because the jet stream, the, the ridge of the, the upper ridge of the jet stream went right into the Arctic and it brought tremendous amounts of heat and moisture um, and the way, because of that setup, there was, a, there, there was also severe winter storms in the U.S. in 2018, warm ocean, warm Gulf Stream, um, suddenly very, very cold continent, big, huge temperature extreme, huge number of winter storms, lots of snow, something called the Beast, of the e Beast from the East in Europe in March 2012, Re record extreme cold outbreaks over Europe in March over all of Europe, okay, because of the jet stream trough which covered Europe. Okay, so this can all be related to the Arctic causing, the Arctic warming resulting in the huge waviness of the jet streams. So climate change is certainly not linear, okay, it's a highly nonlinear process and it affects some regions a lot more than other regions. And you know, a lot of it is because of the jet stream configuration that is slowing and becoming wavier. That's the most significant point of what is happening due to the huge Arctic warming. So 
on the land, the terrestrial system, there's declining terrestrial snow cover. It's declining at about a rate of 22, 24% per decade, spring snow cover. The decline of the ice on Greenland, okay, huge mass losses of ice on Greenland, which is raising sea level, increasing the rate of sea level rise. Lake ice is changing significantly. All the northern lakes are thawing much faster, taking longer to freeze up. So the, you know, the rivers also are flowing um, for longer times in the year. So the discharge into the Arctic is increasing. And this brings nutrients and lots of fresh water into the Arctic. And the fresh water in the Arctic allows the freeze up to proceed more easily because the water is fresh as opposed to salty on the surface. The tundra is thawing, the permafrost is thawing, the soils are allowing the growth of vegetation, it's expanding and greening and the types of vegetation are shifting. However, herb, herd populations of caribou and wild reindeer have plummeted by 50% over the last two decades, as I said. So much for Santa's reindeer. What's happening is we're getting more rainfall events in the Arctic as opposed to snowfall events. And that rain is freezing on the ground. It's freezing on the, ton on the herbs in the, that are growing, the greenery in the Arctic is freezing. So the reindeer, the caribou, they don't have access to eat those shrubs and things, and they're basically starving out. So ironically, you know, so the first order you'd think, well, they're going to they're gonna do very well because there's more green vegetation. But unfortunately, this other effect of more rainfall means that there's less greenery available for them to access and their populations have plummeted by half just in the last two decades. Okay, because of the atmosphere and ocean warming, the Arctic is no longer returning to the extensively frozen region of past decades. The Arctic sea ice is younger, it's thinner, it covers less area than in the past. The wintertime maximum sea ice extent is also re re nearing record lows. The 12 lowest sea ice extents have occurred in the last 12 years. The, we no longer have older and thicker ice, which is harder and more durable. And it's, it's ejected most of the salt, most of the brines from the ice. So it's very, very hard, less inclusions. It's less, it's, so the, the younger sea ice has the brine, it has the salt within it, so it's perforated like Swiss cheese. So it's more vulnerable to melting in the summer. It's not a cohesive pack of ice. It's broken up and fractured. So it can, I like how they put it here, it's liable to move, here we go, it's liable to move unpredictably. So what happens if one summer, you know, the ice has melted so back so far that there's just, you know, a little group of it in the center, in the, circling the North Pole. And then if weather conditions are suddenly conducive to huge export, that whole pack is just moved out into the Atlantic. Boom, no sea ice left. When scientists, and Peter Wadhams was heavily involved in this from British nuclear submarines, using sonar under the ice, pointing upwards from nuclear submarines, British nuclear submarines, to measure the thickness of the ice. So that started in 1985, 16% of the ice pack was very old, multi-year ice. So mostly very fresh, very pure, very hard, dif you know, thick, difficult to melt out. But by 2018, the old ice was only, only made up less than 1% of the ice pack. So basically it's all vanished. Decline of 95% in 33 years, but it's basically all vanished. The only thick ice in the Arctic is really young ice that is ridged up that is packed, that is blown by the wind and ridges up, packed, you know, to, to uh, thickness. So that's totally different from multi-year ice, and it's difficult for satellites to tell the difference between the two. So I think, you know, I suspect that that 1% is 
most of that 1% is just the, you know, yeah, it's, it's not multi-year ice. In fact, it's, it's young ice that is ridged up and piled up, mostly along the uh, northern um, coast of the Canadian archipelago. So we're also getting a lot more advection. That's horizontal transport of water from the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans into the Arctic. Okay, um, so there's uh, a lot of our regions of the Arctic Ocean that are now ice-free, you know, towards the end of the summer, and they weren't before. So later, so basically there's later sea ice freeze up, earlier ice break up. So the thickness of the land fast ice, the ice that is attached to the shores, is much less. Okay, this land, land fast ice is ice that hardens and fastens to the coastline. So it's the most accessible to uh, local peoples who basically hunt seal at the interface. They go out on the ice and where, where the ocean starts, they uh, holes in the ice, etc. they hunt the seals. And of course, there's less and less land fast ice. It's not growing out as far. There's far fewer um, success in hunting. Okay, and also this land fast ice, it stops waves from eroding the shoreline, which is permafrost a lot of it. So with no land fast ice, the waves can erode the shoreline, cause collapses and sinkholes and things, and release lots of CO2 and methane because they expose the, the organic material to warm temperatures and then it can thaw and uh, release greenhouse gases. So the North Slope, of Alaska, for example, the extent of land fast ice is only, it's only going out half as far offshore as it did compared to the 70s. Okay, and it's also a lot thinner than it was. Um, the Bering Sea, basically almost no ice in the Bering Sea um, for the entire 2017-18 season. See, this early breakup had a profound effect on ocean primary productivity. Okay, so phytoplankton, for example, blooms were 500% higher than normal in this region. And there were also a lot of these, uh, some of these algae species were very toxic. These algal blooms would then talk, you know, be very toxic and they would get concentrated in clams, seals, walrus, and whales and have detrimental effects on the health of the marine life in the Arctic. So this is a very significant thing. And uh, the other thing is that you might not, that's a bit surprising, is the marine microplastics. We all know about the plastics in the ocean. Okay, we know about the gyres, the five main gyres where plastic is concentrated. And these plastics are broken down and over time degrade and they, we get these microplastics that are then ingested by marine life, etc. The problem with, with the Arctic is there's a concentration of marine microplastics. That, so the, the concentrations of these plastics in the remote Arctic Ocean are higher than in all other ocean basins in the world. The ocean currents, which carry water up into the Arctic, and then that's part of the thermohaline circulation and then descend into the deep abyss, well, these plastics float, and a lot of them are just brought up to the Arctic where they concentrate and accumulate. They're not brought down to the deep abyss bottom of the ocean floor. They stay at the surface, and therefore they concentrate up in the Arctic. Okay, um, so this is a problem. This is a huge problem, of course. Okay, so there's many new and rapidly emerging threats that are taking form you know, in, in the Arctic. The Arctic is like the Achilles heel of the climate system. We know that the poles are warming much, much faster than the equator. So the ecosystems, the chemistry, the physical nature of the Arctic, the ability of the thermohaline circulation to be sustained, all of these things are under threat from a rapidly warming Arctic. Okay, so I'm going to talk about some of the more deep, specific details of snow cover, sea ice, and, and some of these other effects 
in, in subsequent videos. Thank you for listening.